two balls to go. Three runs needed. All out to make it. It could be six, and it's cut off by Comrade Hunt. He's going to it off. One run. The second run brings the scores level. The next one will win the match. Hunt Slow is coming back. Oh, he's out. out. Run out by a foot. Wonderful return. So there's two balls left. The scores are level. I've been bowling for a run through hours, so, you know, I, I was pretty tired at that time, and, um, uh, he, Frank Rowe was a great captain. He would come up every ball and tell you something, sometimes funny, sometimes not so funny. And um, I remember the last ball I bowled, he said to me, well, you know, remember if you, if you bowl a more ball, you'll never be able to go back to my village, which was fool. So I planted my foot um, above the oh, yard behind the crease, you know. <laughs> and the match is tied. The first tie in Chess Match history, truly the most sensational finish of all time. Okay, we're here tonight to celebrate uh, Clem's book, if we can see that. Uh, <coughs> Professor Clem Citron, some of you know, one of the greatest historians in, 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 in the Caribbean, uh, now in Coventry, uh, who's written this wonderful uh, tome, which is available outside, a uh, £15 specially, on, on Joe Solomon. It's a, it's a heavy read, it's a heavy book and a heavy read. It's, Brilliantly researched, as always by Clem. Uh, why did you write it? Why, why did I write this particular yeah. book? Yeah. Um, well, it's... Um, there's, there <laughs> there's, there's an extraordinary plantation called Fort Morant. And when I was growing up, I discovered that... Put your phones off, please. That's all, that's all. Three of the batsmen in the West Indies team came from this plantation. I was only about eight or nine years of age, but it dawned on me that how could three members of the West Indies team, something that in my own home was something you revered, how could three come from a place that was only about 10 miles away from, from me? So from the beginning, um, the fact that Rohan Kanhai, Basil Butcher, and Joe Solomon came from this particular plantation, fascinated me all my life. So I thought at some point, I got to try to find out why. What happened here? What was going on to produce this miracle? <coughs> and what's the answer? Well, it is an extraordinary plantation. And that is why as a historian, um, it's not enough to say that all these plantations were terrible and that uh, bookers exploited everybody and so on. That's not, that, it's not enough to say that. There was something extraordinary about this plantation. I think it was probably the greatest, most developed plantation of, of all the plantations in the history of, of, of Guyana. Um, it is interesting that that plantation was not a Booker plantation. It was not owned by one of the big companies. It was owned by two Anglo-Indian brothers. So they had a greater degree of autonomy to introduce reforms and to make the place much more habitable. And I think that that created an atmosphere of optimism that pervaded Port Morant. And I document that in the book with all the educated people and so on. Um, that it really was, it had qualities which no other place had. And to add to that, our country, British Guyana, as it was then, was chronically malarial. We are people who were greatly affected by, the, um, by malaria. But this particular part of the Guyana, British Guyana coast was much less malarial. It was open to the breeze coming from the Atlantic there on the quarantine coast. It also had a lot of um, salt water in front as opposed to seawater. And that went against the development of the Anopheles um, malarial mosquitoes. So there were a lot of things going in his favor. Apart from that, it had a very progressive manager, a man named J.C. Gibson, who was the manager from 1906 to 1938. So there were a lot of positives there. And many people already, they were given land on the plantation, it drained and irrigated land to grow rice, to grow vegetables, to do all kinds of things. So it was really a remarkable place, very different. 
and there was tremendous ambition and optimism. With regards to cricket specifically, um, I discovered, well, later on I discovered that the first Barbitian to represent the West Indies was a fast medium bowler, a man named John Trim, who unfortunately made the West Indies team um, when he, in 1948, when he was already in his 30s. But he certainly should have been in the West Indies team long before. And he was a remarkable man. He only played four test matches. But he, he got his wickets at something like 16 each. You know, even better than the great uh, Marco Marshall, who played uh, on the Clive. But um, no, it was a, an extraordinary place. One final story. And that was, a man came from India in, in the 1890s. A man named D.W.D. Cummins. He was a colonial official in India. And he came to look at the conditions of these plantations. And um, he said things were pretty awful in many of them. But he said when he went to, to Port Morant in 1891, in August of 1891, he was overwhelmed by the extent, not only to which the conditions were better than other places, but the people had a kind of bravado. They felt that they were, um, you know, they could stand up and they could argue. And he said he found that very challenging and very interesting, that they could argue with anybody. And then the manager told him, he said, look, I had some problems with them, a few, some of them a few days ago. That they asked me to leave for three days to go and play cricket. And I said, all right, I'll give you three days to play cricket. He said, but then the next three days, they didn't come back because they took the next three days to go and work in the rice field. He said, so when they came back, I said, I got to charge, you got to send you to court. So they went to court and they were convicted for breach of the labor contract. And you know what they did? They walked with money to pay. They walked with, and they found that um, they had to pay uh, $7 fine. But they had enough to pay because they were shovel men making good money. They didn't um, pay the money because they found out that they were only going <clears> to, <throat> if they didn't pay the money, they only had to spend one week in jail. So they went and all, all of them spent one week in jail and then went back to work. <laughs> so they must have loved cricket from a very hard very early age, man. And look, look at the cricketers they produce. I mean, just off the bat, we're talking here with John Trim to start with, who made his debut in 1948. Our, um, <coughs> Basil Butcher and Rowan Kanai. Uh, Rowan Kanai, who made his debut in 1957 here in England. Basil and Joe, who made their debut in India in 1958. <clears throat> and then later on, a fellow named Alvin Kalicharan, who made his debut, I think, in 1972. So it was quite a remarkable place. What, was it, what was it that bound them together? Were, were they all from one part of India? Were they all Hindus? Were they all Muslims? What was it? No, no, no. John Trim was of African background. So was Basil Butcher. <laughs> so no, no, nothing at all. There wasn't anything that bound them in that sense at all. I think what bound them was uh, a, a, a real obsession with the game. And the fact that the manager, the man J.C. Gibson, he wasn't a Scotsman like a lot of the managers. He was an Englishman from the Southeast, so he knew the game. And he created a proper place for them to play, a better uh, community, not a community center, a better um, ground for them to play. And he also allowed some of the people on the estate there to be on the organizing committee so they had responsibility themselves. They had that confidence to do these kinds of things. It is truly a remarkable place. And to understand, I'm not going to talk about how many doctors and lawyers and businessmen. And, and, and Chetty Jagan. <laughs> oh, I forgot about that. <laughs> um, yes, 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 yes. I, I, I've, written a, I've written a book on Chetty Jagan, which might not be very popular with some people, but never mind. Um, um, yes, of course. Um, Jenny came from that plantation, yes. But, uh, no, Joe, tell us about Joe as a person, as a cricketer. <clears throat> well, Joe was not in the mold of many of the great West Indian batsmen, the style, the panache of the three W's, of Sobers and Kanhai 
and later on people like Richards and Clive Lloyd and people who had a certain flavor of panache. But um, he was almost, if I'm to think of a parallel in Clive's team, he was more like Larry Gomes, who was a stabilizer coming in late after these attractive batsmen for one reason or another probably fell early and you need to consolidate. And I think that was the point that Joe played in 14 of the 15 test matches captained by Frank Worrell. Now, <laughs> there were better batsmen around. I would say Seymour Nurse was certainly a better batsman than, than, um, than Joe. But I think that Frank had a number of things in mind. One, he knew he had these attractive attacking players who were going to uh, win the Australian minds and hearts and minds of the Australians. He was going on his first tour. He was the first black man to captain the West Indies team. He wanted to make an impression in terms of the quality and the attractiveness of the play because cricket was really in the doldrums by the end of the 1950s. But he also wanted to have a team that had resilience. He was, he found it abominable that this word Calypso, Calypso cricket was being used. I think Clive has objected to that on many occasions as well. That he didn't want this tag and Calypso cricket to be applied to this team that he was captaining anymore. He wanted a team that had solidity, that could apply itself, that had consistency in its performance, that was professional. He also wanted a team that had people who could be ambassadors of the region. And this was the context in which the West Indies Federation was already beginning to be a bit shaky, almost falling apart. And he was conscious that like the University of the West Indies, this West Indies team, now captained by himself, had to represent the region at a time when the political fabric was beginning to fall apart. And Joe represented many of those qualities, a consistency of purpose, very orthodox player, um, not gifted with many strokes, but um, could give you, with the help of the tail enders, when things didn't go well, could add another 100 runs or so with the help of with those <coughs> tail enders. Batting with people like uh, Lance, people forget that Lance was capable of quite some batsmanship at one point. And um, yes, so he had that. <coughs> the other thing was that Frank really wanted this team to be ambassadors for the region. And he wanted discipline and he wanted people to carry themselves well within as well as beyond the boundary. And Joe, the very quiet man, Joe room, you know, Joe might take he drinks, but Joe will fight and cost with nobody. <laughs> and I think that what he did was he represented the kind of solidity and the kind of decency that Frank wanted in all his players because he know he knew that in Australia in 66 to 1 that this team was speaking for for black people for people throughout the region and at the end of that tour in 66 to 1 300 although West Indies didn't win the series he lost it um, 2 to 1 I won't go into the details I think we, we won it, never mind. But on the 17th of February, 1961, when they were leaving the city of Melbourne, over 300,000 people came out into the streets of Melbourne to say goodbye to these people. And a couple of days after, the Archbishop of Melbourne said, they may play with us, but they may not stay with us because you had the white Australia policy None of those members of the team could have been given citizenship or, or residence in Australia. And he said, I hope someday that this country will be impressed by the qualities demonstrated by the great West Indian players here today. And that this, the way they have carried themselves on the field and off the field and have captured the imagination of the Australian people, that this will influence policies in this country in the future. And about 12 years after they scrapped the great, they scrapped the great Australia policy, uh, the white Australia policy. Today, 
If India and Pakistan are playing, they are looked the other day, the two teams were playing at the MCG. You had 90,000 people, primarily people of Indian and Pakistani background. Well, I think that great tour led by Frank Worrell and that particular image you have there of the first tight test, the with Joe knocked down the wicket side on to dismiss McKiff to tie the test. But before that, when Australia were virtually having a walk in the park to win the test match, he ran out, <coughs> virtually side on as well. He ran out Alan Davidson, who was at 80. So there were two crucial runouts in that particular um, test, which I think shaped the whole perception of the West. One question, Clem. How will Joe be remembered? What's his, what's his effort <clears throat> Well, I think he'll be remembered as in the context of um, the great West Indies team captained by Frank Worrell and a pivotal state not only in our cricketing history, but the way I write these books, these, our cricketing history cannot be separated from our social history. And I think that is the context in which as an integral part of Frank's perception of what this team should be and the balance of the team, that Joe had a crucial role within that context. But Joe also had a crucial role in the context of British Guyana cricket as an example of a, a dedicated player. And I think <coughs> Clive in his early years, when he came into the British Guyana team, would have, would have played with Joe, possibly in a few matches in which Joe captain. So but he also he, taught the next generation through Working for Booker. Oh, oh, definitely, because um, when he when he got employment with Booker, of course he worked under the great Frank, um, Clyde Walcott. Clyde Walcott made a tremendous contribution to the development of cricket on these plantations and bringing these people to the fore. Because hitherto, if you lived outside of Georgetown, it was hard to be recognized. So Joe was an integral part of the team that uh, Clyde Walcott had constructed within the context of the Sugar Producers Association and the plantations. So the plantations now were the nursery that brought all these players um, <coughs> to the fore, not just the clubs in Georgetown anymore. So in that context, he was part of that transformation. Let's see a little bit more of the tight test. The 1960 Brisbane test between Australia and the West Indies produced the first of only two test matches ever to be tied. Jonathan Agnew asked the current West Indies manager in his hall, who bowled that epic final over, for no, no. his memories of the historic finish. I won't age you too much, but I was born the year of the tied test, because I've seen that last over so many times on television. And you too, you, you, you must be so fresh in your mind still. Yeah, the fact that's where, where uh, really it was a, a, a beginning of our era. Um, the West Indies had won over nineteen sixty. They were branded as individual good cricketers. Were were not a cohesive force at all. And Sir Frank Wall, he molded us into that team. And uh, to be fair, I think that Rishi Benoit was really good. There's a few aggressive players, and I think that the boss lost a bit of That does actually poke well some glory or something. To David, in, in my opinion, I thought it was one of the best cricket matches I ever played. And so to the last over, but one seven minutes, seven runs. <laughs> And then they'll another quick symbol and David Simon from Davidson out. Number four eighty. Only three wickets left. Only six minutes. And seven lines still wanting. So number nine batsman. One who grad. Squeezing out a run to deep mid on. So it's six to win. Sobers to Benno. Who wants to farm the strike. He can't. He can't get down the other end to face Hall. And now, the very last over of the match, bowled by Wes Hall. My club, they're running for anything now. One run, one more run. Straight away, one, five. Second ball to Benno. Benno hooking and he's caught behind by Alexander. Benno out for 52. In the back of the final, we dare say now that Australia will win. Six balls left. Five wanted, two wickets in hand, and no run for Mackett. Five runs wounded off five balls. Well, he didn't get a touch, but Rod was running for a bite. Missing and looking hit the stumps. Mackett must have been out. Four runs wanted.
Paul Bowles. Three balls to go. Three ones needed. Well now to make it. It could be six, and it's cut off by Comrade Hunt. He's going to have it off. One run. The second run brings the scores level. The next one will win the match. Hunt Slow is coming back. Hey. Oh, he's out. Run out by a foot. Wonderful return. So with two balls left. Level. I've been bowling for more than two hours, so, you know, I, I was pretty tired at that time, and um, uh, he, Frank Ball was a great captain. He would come up every ball and tell you something, sometimes funny, sometimes not so funny. And um, I remember the last ball I bowled, he said to me, well, you know, remember if you, if you bowl a more ball, you'll never be able to go back to my village, which was true. So I planted my foot um, a the yard behind the crease, you know. And the match is tied. The first tie in Chess match history threw in the most sensational finish of all time. Hard to tell from the pictures that we see now, but how, how far was that run out? out? Was, it, was it comfortable during the time that was out? Yes, well, we knew that he was out. And, um, you know, it was just that the, 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 Joe Solomon had one stump. You know, to to have a go at and um, have him uh, throw him the ball. Well, you know, ninety percent of those miss. Mm-hmm. But you know, bullseye. So I think that was the the, the spectacular thing about it. That everybody was so caught up in it. But perhaps even my umpire, when he went out, he was probably a foot after ground. So everybody was very ecstatic about it. Uh, Simon, <coughs> the only author of this book, uh, he, he's co-authored it with uh, the very great Ian McDonnell, uh, Guyana's uh, current uh, poet laureate. Uh, great man. Um, we, he, we, we caught up with him in Toronto uh, a week or two back. Let's see what he has to say about, about Joe. Joe, you know, is a, uh, he simply is a magnificent human being for a start, which is a pretty good start. Um, I've known jo, uh, Joe for a very long time as a friend, but before that, of course, I admired him tremendously as a great uh, West Ind- Guyanese and West Indian cricketer. And always admired him for that, and always thought that he was very underestimated. And the, the thing about Joe, even before I knew him well, he seemed to me such a calm, wonderful, very, very settled human being. And I, I liked him for that, and I liked him for what he contributed to a Guyanese and West Indian cricket, especially West Indian cricket. And I, I was, when I read a bit, later on in the cricket books, I found that, you know, Worrell was a huge admirer of Joe. And since Worrell was perhaps the best captain uh, West Indies has ever had and a, and a wonderful man himself, the judgment of Joe Solomon by Frank Worrell meant a lot to me. Then later on, of course, I got to know Joe well in the sugar industry when we were friends and colleagues. It wasn't just simply a matter of cricket. And when I got to know Joe, I realized what a wise, calm, wonderful human being he was. So, you know, to answer your question, come back to your question, the magic of Joe was that he was simply a very, very good and very, very delightful and very, very interesting human being. There's a passage in the book where you talk about seeing Solomon come out of the border, you know, come out to play. Can you sort of describe that to us? What, what, the, what, what, what was your feeling about that? Well, whenever you saw Joe Solomon come out to bat, um, whether you were watching on television or listening on radio uh, or or actually at border seeing him coming out, uh, you knew that he was going to have a calming influence. For one thing, you could be almost certain that he was not going to get out. He was going to stay there and make uh, keep the scoreboard ticking over, play for his team always, not just for himself by any means. And you just felt a sense of security when Joe Solomon came out to bat. And I think that that was not just, uh, certainly not just me, and not just the audience, not just the people in the in, in the ground, but that was a feeling of, um, for instance, uh, Worrell, his captain, and his other uh, players with him. Now, uh, 62 years ago, the tie test, I mean, you're, you and I are both old enough to remember that. What do you remember of that last over? You mean the tide test in Brisbane? Yes, in Brisbane. Yeah, well, 
I remember that very well, John, although it is what, a very long time ago, what, 60 years more? Yeah, 62. 60 years, two years. I remember that because uh, I was listening around a uh, radio with four friends uh, in, in, in Georgetown. And I remember that last over well. I mean, I almost remember every ball. I remember that because uh, I was listening around a uh, radio with four friends uh, in, in, in Georgetown. And I remember that last over well. I mean, I almost remember every ball. Um, and it was, <laughs> I mean, it was, what can I say? It was so exciting. We didn't believe at the start of that over that there was a chance that we could possibly win or even tie. Because remember, I think they still had three wickets. Uh, and they only had uh, eight runs or six runs to make or something. And uh, it didn't look at the start of that over as if we could possibly uh, win or, or, or draw or tie. And as, they, as the, the, the over went on, it got more and more excited. And I remember it very well. You can imagine the four friends of us, four of us, five of us, uh, sitting down there, looking, uh, listening to the radio, and not looking at it on television. We didn't have it on television. We listened on the radio. And every ball, not being able to see it, but listening to it was, was I, can, I, can, I can think of it now, John. It's a poem I wrote to uh, Forjo, and it's called The Throw. The Throw. Tension in the gut like knife. Skipper say, stay calm. Where's bowl, Klein play, my fellow fielder dash. Young Peter, in a rush to try run Mekif out. All to play for, good test becoming great. I know it is historic. They have one run to win. We Windies could still save the joyful day. I know I is a quiet man, but I was born for this. Was in me the desire, the glory or the loss. Body, mind, soul took aim. Leave it to me, I say. There we are, Ian MacDonald, um, Guyana's greatest contemporary poet, as well as, well as a cricket, cricket fan. This book was your idea. Why do you want it written and what do you think of the end product? Well, I've always wanted that. The thing is, even before I knew him well, and remember, I knew, uh, I knew Joe afterwards as a colleague and friend in Sugar, and he was a wonderful cricket coach and a wonderful sports organiser, quite apart from being a cricket earlier on. And when I got to know him as a friend, I realised that he was a, a very great, as I've said before, great human being. And I've always thought that Joe Solomon as a cricketer was very, very, how can I put it, underrated. Certainly, he never had a book written about him. And I always remember that. And I saw books coming out about quite what seemed to me quite ordinary cricketers, uh, county players in England, some cricketers in Australia, some people in Pakistan or India, that to me did not approach Joe in importance. And yet Joe never had a thing written about him. So I've always, forever, well, 30, 40 years, uh, uh, said, said often, as often as I could that Joe should have a book written about him. He deserved it. And, uh, and then Clem C. Turan came along. And, you know, Clem and I talked about this for a long time. And Joe, if I may say so, had the good luck to get Clem C. Turan to write this book. Uh, and he, in my opinion, has done a magnificent job. I think it is a one. We must remember, if, if I could just go on on that score, because I, I think it really is a wonderful book. But let me just go on a bit about Clem, because remember that Clem C. Tran certainly is the leading historian, not only in Guyana, but in the Caribbean. He's a wonderful historian. He's a wonderful writer. What's your birthday message to Joe on his 92nd birthday? Well, I will say, my, myself nearly being 90, I will say, Joe, keep on going. You're a good example to people like me. Uh, but secondly, I would say, Joe, thank you very, very much indeed for all that you've achieved in your life, not only in cricket, 
but as a human being to your family and friends and community. You are a very wonderful human being. Not bad for 88. Um, he, he rang me today to say, see if everything was all right. It, uh, that's, that's how much he cared. All right, the stars keep coming. The ne next, next star is, is Red Pereira. Uh, the great Caribbean green commentator. So there's there's Joe who's actually got he's got a copy of the book in New York, uh, and uh, he's in 92, 92 now. Clem, yes? He's the oldest uh, West Indies Test cricketer. Right? Right. Okay, now uh, let's see what uh, Rez Pereira has to say about Joe. Hi, I'm Joseph Rez Pereira. I've been a West Indies commentator for over forty years working in conjunction mainly with Tony Cozier, the late. But um, Joseph Stanislaus was a man for all seasons. I mean, he was a player. He was a selector, a player for both British Guyana then and the West Indies, a manager. And then he worked with the Booker's Company, uh, developing cricket in, in the Sugar Estates. He made his debut in 1956. So what a debut. Guyana run up some 601 for five, of which uh, Bruce Perry got 111, Rowan Kanai 129, Bunchy Butcher was 154 not out, and uh, Joe Solomon 114 not out. And in the same year, Solomon made 108 as Guyana ran up 581. He made 800 for Guyana. I had the pleasure of seeing uh, six of them. And, uh, you know, he got 100 against Jamaica. He got 100 against Barbados, 146. Uh, he got 110 um, against uh, Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, for the Western East, he played 27 tests, averaged 34, uh, scored just over 1,300 runs. Of course, made famous the, the tie test when he threw the wicket down, seeing only one stump in Brisbane, where there's a large picture somewhere near uh, the, the Gabba, and his work after Clyde Walcott and Robert Christiani had done a lot of work for Booker's in the Sugar Estates. Joe Solomon then continued that and uh, made a, a great contribution to Guy in the Cricket. He was well respected by the late Sir Frank Worrell because he trusted Solomon's skill. He trusted his discipline. He batted at number six and therefore didn't get a chance to build a lot of innings. A lot of his innings, well, 50-odd, 60-odd, didn't get on to score more than 100, but uh, a, a great a great contribution and a great man, uh, a, a humble man, um, pleasant, easy speaking, and uh, very nice uh, to have known him over the, the years. There he is. How old is he? He's, a, he's in his early eighties. Early eighties. Uh, this is uh, th thanks to Rob. We got that from Sir Lucia. Yeah. Um, okay. It's actually a the, uh, the book again. And um, um, Clem, will you swap with Clive Lloyd, please? Sure. After a genuine legend, Sir Clive Lloyd. Clive, come on up. If I may take a seat, sir. You can. I've warmed it up for you. <laughs> What, what do you remember about uh, Joe Clyde? Did you play with him in your very early days? Yes, um, in my salad days. Yes, um, <laughs> yeah. He was a he was the rock really, a man for crisis. Wherever there's any problems, he he would go and stabilize the situation. He was tremendous <coughs> cricket, really. and I suppose people say he was unrest in your life, but it wasn't that. It's was just that. He had this knack to play just like a Gavaska or play like Larry Gomes, you know, stabilize situations. It was great to have him there because we had a lot of flamboyant players around and he was the stabilizer. So Jay and Joe did a marvelous job uh, for Gann and the West Indies during this, this period. And he coached um, quite a lot of young cricketers too. I uh, oh. was talking about um, a piece of real estate in, in that area, um, in Port Moran. But I think that we have even better bit of real estate in Queenstown. 
<laughs> yeah. um, we have four test cricketers and one president. This is democratic. So the you know so we um, it is uh, it, yes we we proud of what we. How much did you overlap with Joe? Who oh, not a lot really because um, he finished after sixty five I think and I played in nineteen sixty six against India. What was Definitely. he like? You come. You went to the British Guiana team with him, obviously. What was he like to you as a, as a young upstart? Oh, yeah, well, the, the point is that we, you know, we looked up to those guys really because they were they were tremendous cricketers. And um, in those days, you know, you you were you were there, you were, but you never heard. You weren't heard as such, but you were seen. But um, you didn't have that much, you know, sort of um, sort. Of, Mix, mixing with the, the older guys, uh, but we still admired them, and then we still do, uh, because they're in a different era, difficult situations, and um, and they they had the prejudices in the West Indies, just like in other, in other places. Frank Worrell should have been captain before he, he was made captain, and um, Alexander was made captain in front of Frank Worrell. Could you could you imagine that? And the ambassador Butcher told me that um, he was batting in in Barbados. Frank Worrell had a hundred, hundred on. And Basil had just come in and he was there. I think the captain said, but Butcher, get on with it. <laughs> and Basil had a swipe, got out, and he declared. And um, Frank Worrell told him, he said, you know, I, I had a hundred and uh, he didn't ask me to, to have a goal. <laughs> um, but that's, that's what you did as a, you know, as a youngster. So when they were going to Australia, Basil was going to Ghana. Because <laughs> he didn't get any runs um, uh, in, in that test match. So you had those sort of things. You had those sort of prejudices um, in our cricket. And, and hopefully that, you know, we got rid of that. Uh, you know, but, he, he, but the team, by the time he got it, took it over. <laughs> A change from being a largely white team, a colonial team, to being a largely black and brown team. Well, yes, I think people were then being picked and married. You know, we had captains that really shouldn't have been there. They weren't good enough to be there. But, um, and I asked that question and I said, well, why is it that we had white captains? Well, they said, well, we were very subservient. We would only, <laughs> we would only, you know, listen to the guy that were white up there. And I said, well, how stupid can that be? But the point that was the situation that we had in those days. So we had to go through a lot of prejudice. And we, we came through that. And we came through by playing well, doing well. You know, I became captain because I suppose um, it, it was time for us to, 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 to move on. But we, we still did things in a, in, in a terrible manner. I remember I was playing for uh, Lancashire against Yorkshire and we played in the test match ground the Roses game and I, I got a hundred so I was quite chuffed and I walked around with my chest you know, making a red rose hundred and um, a fellow called Howard Booth said um, oh, congratulations Clive I said oh we played on a good pitch it was a test match pitch and so on you know he said, no, no, not, uh, I'm not uh, talking about that. You were just made captain of the West Indies. So I had to hear it <laughs> from, from an English writer. Uh, you would have thought that somebody would have given me a call, a telegram or something. But that is how I was made captain, how I knew I was captain. But I'm saying we, we started a lot of silly things in those days. Um, but... Things have changed. What did it mean to you to be captain of the West Indies? For 12 years to you, captain? Yes, we have another bit, yeah. What does it mean to you to be captain of the West Indies? Well, you, you couldn't get a, a greater accolade, really. You were captain in f five, million, five million people were depending on you. And a guy told me once, he said, you know, you are more important than any prime minister in the West Indies. <laughs> I, said, I said, why? He said, when you make a decision, you made it for those five million people, the Trinidad or the Barbadian um, 
prime minister to make decisions only for those islands, you know. So you are a very important person. But it is not only that. It's it, you know when Frank World did what they did and the and the other players, we we sort of created something. We we had this. People realized that um, this you know this was a nation that right was that was rising, and um, and sport to me. You know, it's one of the most, it's very important. It's an important part of the lives of a lot of people. You know, I, and the things that we've, we've achieved over the years, we, we, made, we won 11 test matches. Without losing. We played 29 without losing. And one stage, if you were 17 years old, you would have never seen the West Indies lose. <laughs> so those are things that you, you've got to be proud of, you know. World Cups, we have won six World Cups, five million people. So we have a lot to be thankful for and to be proud of. Why was the team so good? Why was the consistency so good? Is that you? Well, the point is that most of these guys came, 99% of the players had never played a test match. So they grew up under me. And, you know, I was older than they were and so on. So you had to have that discipline. We had things like curfews and People think, oh, you, you're being regimental, but that wasn't the point. If you're playing in Australia, and there's 110 in the shade, you can't go out and drink at night and, and then want to bowl fast or bat well. And you have to face guys who are bowling at 100 miles an hour. You've got to, you know, you've got to have everything going for you. And um, we shared everything. The, the, um, the guy, the, the Australian guy that we had, he got the same money as we got. We shared everything that we won and so on. Was he worth it? Oh, yes, he was. He was good. He was excellent. And I think that's what probably what we need now. Somebody that we have. Guys that are 20 years old and have to pass a yo-yo test. <coughs> you go, you, when you're 20 years old, you run all day. My mother said that young people don't get Tired, they get hungry. <laughs> and it's true, you get hungry, you, you run all day, you play all day, and, but you want something to eat. But we have young players, and I look at some of these players in the, the, and I, they come up, and I, oh, Lord. <laughs> I, I don't know, I, I, I find it strange that we, we allow our cricketers to get to this. Guardians man didn't miss two planes the other day to get to Australia. <laughs> well, that's an odd situation. <laughs> missed two planes, you didn't miss one. Two, two planes. planes. Yeah. Um, the point is that do they have the same, you know, that, that drive to do well? That pride in making a hundred and winning and so on. And make, making your West Indians feel very proud. And the point is, we didn't even, we didn't only make West Indians uh, proud. We made people outside of the West Indians. They one they copied the things that we did. I remember the, the two Australian guys to who, who just stopped playing. Hussey brother, he said, "Clive, when you came to Australia, <coughs> we supported you. We didn't support the Australians." And that was rather strange. Um, when we go to India, you treated with reverence. reverence. They love. Us. Because you know we bring a sort of excitement to 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 the, to the game. Why have they lost the hunger? IPL, CPL, too too much money, too easy. Well, yes, I, it's one, it could be one, but I think money is a subsidiary of success, and I don't I don't know why they 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 do not want to play for the country. You know that's what that's what you you that's what you wanted to do when you first started to play for your country. But the point is, you have to look at the situation. I think it's affected, this IPL have affected the rest of these more than anybody else, any other team. If you have a guy from Ghana, and he's getting 800,000 US for three or four weeks, you multiply that by 220. <laughs> now you see how much money that is. You're nearly 300 million Ghana dollars. So, it, and if he's playing for five years, or six years, you, you see what you see what's happening. But the point is with our players is that 
all are, the other countries, people want to do well. Right. They want to still play for the country. Our guys don't seem to want to. So you can afford to miss two planes and that sort of salary? Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 I can. I hope this guy probably has a problem and I hope he sorts it out because I hate to see great talent go to waste because he's a very good cricketer. How do you feel about the Irish match the other day? <laughs> well, yeah. We've been beaten by ten years, so that's right. <laughs> it doesn't really. Nine, but the point is that nineteen sixty nine played that. Yeah, nineteen sixty nine. We got bowled out. Is it twenty something? Uh, uh, twenty five. Twenty five. Twenty five. Twenty five. Twenty five. And we left here play, after playing a wonderful test match, <coughs> and we went. We flew straight to Ireland. And the next day it was raining and so on. And Basil, which was the captain, never watched the pitch. He tossed in front of the pavilion <laughs> and said, We'll bat. <laughs> I went back in with Clyde Walker. They put us back in in a one day game. <laughs> and he said, Listen, Clyde, let's stay here and just. Sort of. And we batted out the, the time. But the point is, is that. What is happening now is that you're getting knocked out of some, a competition that you won twice, <clears throat> you know, and um, people, pe people really, they, they feel proud of, of, our, of the West Indies team. And we are sort of not giving them th that, that attitude to support anymore. You were in Guyana for the CPL. Yeah. What did you make of that? The cricket card? Yeah, I, 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 I worked with the... Warriors for about 12 days. Mm -hmm. When I got there, we were bottom of the pile, we were the last. And we won four games straight. And we moved up to, to the semi final position. And they only had to win one game and they would have been in the finals. And they lost both games. They had, you know, they got an extra game to, to qualify and they didn't. But I think it's the, I am, it's the attitude. I, I don't see you guys running. I don't see fellas going in the nets and, and, and practicing. We, we did that all the time. And I got a couple of them to do so. Um, I said, one guy, he got 100 and he got naught and one and two. And never went in the net. I said, no, 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 no. you got to go in the nets. And he was a top class, world class player. He got into the nets. And, you know, he got a 50-odd knot, I don't know, not a 60-odd knot. And won two games. But I'm saying that there's nobody there giving them that impetus. You know, but then again, you don't have to do that to professionals. This is your living. If you're working somewhere, you can't come to work at 10 o'clock when you should be here at 8 30. They'll show you the door. Or oh, Mr. Blades. Sure, you got some questions. Make them short and sweet because some of you may now are quite <laughs> tough. Uh, uh, hang on a second. I'm not, not, I'm not hugely in favour of what you guys need to call platforms. A quick question then, go on. Just a quick follow up to what Clive was saying about the approach and attitude. Do you think they spend more time in the jewellers uh, and <laughs> than, than in the mm. nets? Well, well, those chains are expensive, <laughs> I can tell you. <laughs> uh, they're very heavy, too. <laughs> but uh, you got on left, my left hand side of the back. Well, so, Clive, can I say something? What do you think about the standard of batting across the region? Because these guys cannot build an innings, seriously. Yeah. One month have you seen West Indies score 450 or 500 plus? Yeah. And, and occupy maybe a day and a half batting. You don't see it. I think we suffer from cricket intelligence. Yeah. That's the problem. I mean, you have the captain telling the guys and the, some of the coaches that we're power hitters. Well, you, you they hit a six in Australia. You've got to be a real power. Because okay. the boundary, and they, they say it every day, the boundaries are large. And five of them got out, the guys just here, and the boundaries are somewhere there. Why don't you hit it on the ground? The fellow, Coley showed them the other day how to play. You don't have to hit it, you have to go aerial, you, you can hit it on the ground. And you're still batting. And um, we don't seem to weigh up situations as well as the opposition. We give up too early. Anytime we have a tight game, we lose. So something is wrong with our cricket. We need to discuss our cricket more. We need more academies in South Africa. They merge <clears throat> states together to make them stronger, and they have an, they have academies. When you go into the nets, 
your video and you have a, a sit down with your coach and you analyze what you're doing wrong and so on. I, I don't I, I don't see that in our cricket at the moment. And everybody is going here and we're going further down. My question is, you let <coughs> iconic players, many of whom just held their own. But I just wonder when the new, new players came through, how did you instill the values of West Indies mm. cricket in those players? Did you spend some time with them? Did you educate them? <coughs> How did we get to that point where they really represented us as a nation? It's, it's a discussion that we have. Mm -hmm. All those guys, as I said, never played a test match. Mm -hmm. Viv Richard didn't just start winning or get hitting the ball and batting well, or Michael Holding bowling like that. Michael Holding got selected when he hadn't a, a full, full wicket haul for Jamaica. And when we got to the selection committee, Frank, um, uh, uh, Clyde Walker, who was the manager, opened the meeting. He said, Clyde thinks that Michael Holding will learn a lot in Australia because of the bouncier pitches and so on. And, you know, and he was the first person to. And we don't pick it. We don't pick teams. But you see, Clyde had that influence. And the point is, if you're winning, you can only have that influence. Too. So the point is, we, we work things out. For instance, if we have a team meeting, we don't, have, we don't have an analyst. We, we had the trainer who came later. And we probably might get a, an assistant manager. Um, you'd have to beg to get an extra player. And the point is, is that we would sit down, if we're playing against England or Australia, and we will go through every player. Where are we going to bowl to them? Who is going to bowl to them? So that means that we know exactly what is going to happen, how they will bowl to us, you know. And the point is, I got rather smart in the sense that we had a cur we normally have a curfew. So I asked the, um, the I think Stephen Kamashu did. He ran the West Indies Trade Board. We didn't have all these marketing men. And, so. <laughs> and um, okay. he would, we would let him, and I said, listen, I would like to have a meal with the players after we've had our discussion. And um, I'd like you people to pay for it, but and you don't take away their meal money. And he said, oh yes, no problem. But I, it was thinking here that if we can have a meal at about nine o'clock after the team meeting, and we finish about 10, they can't go anywhere. <laughs> it's too late for them to go. But the things that we did too were very strange. I remember we played, we were leading Australia 3 0. And we had different shades of white shirts, off white, some looking white. It was some cream. And I said to Stephen, look at these Australians. We are winning. And they have shorts with their emblem there and it's all in one color. Why can't we do it? He said, oh, order them. And I ordered 60 shirts. So everybody had five shirts. We did. Oh, we, we, we were immaculately turned out. And, um, and I remember Gordon Greenwich took his own money, went into this uh, store and bought about 40 of these shirts. Uh, you know, it's singlets of Econ. And he had them emblazoned across. Class is class, form is temporary. <laughs> you know, and he, he did that himself. <coughs> but I even went further. I can remember we we were in Melbourne, and I said we we're leading three now. We we're staying at the Two Star Hotel down the road, and these guys are staying at the at the, the Melbourne Hotel, it's five star. <coughs> so I said, Stephen, I, we are winning, man. We should be staying at this hotel where these guys are. Magnificent hotel. He said, All right, book in. <laughs> so I booked, we all booked in pristine sheets, hey. large room. <laughs> when you go down for breakfast, you, you have a choice of like, you know, you it, it is marvelous. And, um, and I used to come down every 
breakfast or, or dinner time. And why? Or lunch time or dinner time. Why? There was a lady playing the piano. <laughs> <laughs> so you felt, you felt, yeah, yes, you're getting somewhere. But you can only do that by winning. If you're not winning, you can't get it. We were here in 1973, Rohan was captain, <clears throat> and we, we asked for more money. They gave us 50000 for this tour, and we said, no, well, this can't happen. We need some more money. And I remember Donald Carr saying, listen, you guys haven't won a test match for 21 test matches. We can't give you any more money. And I realized, so winning is important. I wasn't captain then. I said, winning is important. Not only that, we lost out. In the sense, VAT came in. So we had to pay VAT on the 50,000. So they, you know. And we weren't really earning any money, but that was not important. We wanted to win, we wanted to win well to show people that we are professionals and we can play as professionals. And we did for that long while, 17 years. You know. And I think we have a lot to be proud of as West Indian. And I think I'm hoping that one of these days that it will be shown somewhere that we did extremely well. And we will continue to do so if we get the right people. What's your manifesto to say Western New Cricket then? Because it just fired the coach. Well, no, well, the coach, the coach left. But the point is, is that I'm saying now our cricket intelligence, we have to teach people things. It's just like school. How do you get to pass exam? Because you have to have the right people. You've got to be able to inculcate all the things that are good so that when the exam comes, you know, you, you, you just go through it. And you have, and as I said to some of the players the other day, I said, you guys have played 80, more than 80 T20 games. I said, that means that you are, you know, you, you, you guys that are professional and, they're, and they're, you wouldn't have anything there that would confront you that you haven't experienced. And that's how they pick themselves up. I said, your you, wicket has got to be at the premium. You can't just go there and give your wicket away. You're being paid and paid well on people. And when you go to, we, we had some crowds in there. And we had the support, you know. Um, so the point is, it, 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 our situation just didn't happen. It's things that we did. We, we roomed together. And I think they should bring it back. Because if you have young players, you want to room with somebody. You want to talk to somebody. If you're just in your room by yourself, you, 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 you get bored. So I think that now they should try that. So that guys can room together and they talk and discuss things. What about the grassroots? What's to be done there? Well, I think school's cricket should come back. I learned a lot playing in school. Um, you know, and don't uh, people must realize too, I'd never captain anybody when I... Before I kept in Western. So I was thrown into the deep end, but I learned a lot by watching um, my predecessors. And, and the point is that you, you have to you have to retain things. It's important. And that's why being a captain of the of a county side, you have to retain things because you have to remember. We had 300 and odd cricketers, hmm. weaknesses and strengths. Hmm. So retaining things were important. And that is why we learned so much playing county cricket. And, and when we lost that, we, we lost a lot. But we need to strengthen our cricket. If we strengthen our cricket, because in the 70s and the 60s, our, our domestic cricket was excellent. But now you, you, club cricket is dying. You know, our players are not playing county cricket or any, anywhere else for that matter. They're we played around the world, the country. Yeah, right? yeah, we played. Yeah, and the point is that they're playing T20 cricket. That, that's an exhibition. Test cricket is an examination. Absolutely. Yeah. Rob Calls, would you thank Sir Clive very, very much indeed? <laughs>
run out by a foot. Wonderful return. So with two balls left, the score for level. I've been bowling for a run through hours, so, you know, I, I was pretty tired at that time, and um, uh, he, Frank Rowe was a great captain. He would come up every ball and tell you something, sometimes funny, sometimes not so funny. And um, I remember the last ball I bowled, he said to me, well, you know, the number of people, if you bowl a more ball, you'll never be able to go back to my village, which was true. So I planted my foot um, a the yard behind the crease, you know. And the match is tied. The first time in Chess Manchester, truly the most sensational finish of all time.